Thank you, Leslie. If you remain standing for just a moment for the reading of a portion of scripture that we'll look at this morning, it's found in Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, and uh, beginning in verse 23, Jesus says, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the time that we've had to look to you and to worship you today in song, lifting up our voices together. Thank you for the week that's gone by, for the word of God that's implanted, been implanted in the minds and hearts of some of these young people. Lord, our prayer has been all along and still is that you will take that word and multiply all the efforts. Um, Lord, teachers prepare and they, and they give a lesson and it's done and over with, but we, we, we keep being reminded of how Moses prayed that you would take the work of his hands and make it permanent. And, and that's our prayer about this Bible school, that you will take the the work of the hands of the laborers who have been there doing everything from teaching to helping with the uh, uh, crafts and games and all the rest of it to, um, to organizing the whole thing. We're praying that you will take all that effort and that you will use it for eternal purposes in the lives of these young people. And now, Lord, we pray the same this morning. We, we pray that we will not leave the same as we came but that you will do a work in our lives that has eternal benefit and eternal value and eternal consequences, we pray, for the sake of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated, and uh, if you haven't already, please turn to the ninth chapter of Luke. Truly saved, truly saved. That's the theme of this passage from verses 18 through 27 in Luke 9. It asks, as we have seen, three great questions. First question, who is Jesus? Verses 18 through 20. And we find and, or found that he is the Messiah, the anointed one, one appointed by God, but not only that, that he is God in the flesh. And so therefore we saw the price of salvation from the standpoint and perspective of God the Father. He gave his only son. We saw what that means for him to do. Second major question, what did Jesus do? Verses 21 to 22. What did Jesus do? We saw that obedient to... Hang on. Try it again. Thank you. Just to make, just make sure everybody was awake this morning, okay? What did Jesus do? He was obedient. He was obedient to the point that he could be the perfect sacrifice for sin and, and, and follow the Father's direction and commandment to go to the cross and there become for us the Savior. And so the price to the son is easy to see, right? Not only the 33 years that he lived here, but the death that he suffered of humiliation in our part. But now we come to the last question, what must I do? What must I do? Because there's a price, not just to the God the Father, not just to God the Son, but doesn't it make sense that if it costs them something for salvation, it's going to cost us too. It's going to cost us to follow him. Now, I know some of you are sitting there saying, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I thought this was all free. I thought I'd get this uh, on my own. I don't have to pay for this. I thought we just come to Christ by faith and we believe in him. And that's right. That's what we do. Here's the issue. To believe in him means to disbelieve in me. And that's tough. That's the price that we have to pay but to be truly saved according to this passage. That's exactly what has to happen. We have to come to the place where we actually deny self. So just as Christ died for us, 
So we must die with him to self to be truly saved. So let's begin to look at this this week. What must I do? Look at verse 23 again. He said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Three things that Jesus lists here that if we're going to be truly saved must be true of us. First of all, we must deny self. Secondly, we must take up our cross. Thirdly, follow him. I want to look at the first one today. What does it mean to deny self? What does it mean to deny self? Now, the words deny self there are, are in the Greek there, it's an aorist tense, which means this is a point in time action. What that tells us is that there has to come some moment, some point in time when our heart reaches out to Christ, truly saved people have at some point basically renounced self in favor of Christ. They basically said goodbye to self. I choose Jesus. He's going to be my Lord, not me. There's some point where we've done that. Now listen, before you panic, we all, we all, we all go back into selfishness. We all take rabbit trails as we go along this Christian life, right? It's not an easy life. But, beloved, if that moment in time hasn't come where your heart has turned from going this direction to going this direction, you can't be truly saved. It has to be a meaningful experience that takes you from a servant of self to a servant of Christ. And though you will make mistakes and go off here and there occasionally, that's got to be the direction of your life. That's what the verse is telling us here. Now, the, the problem is many of us think we did that. We walked an aisle. We prayed a prayer. We did something. We got baptized. We got confirmed. We did something that we think got us there. And we thought, that's all I need. Now that I've done that, I can go back to life as normal. But the Bible picture is there's no life as normal after we make the decision for Christ. And if that's what we think, the chances are we're holding back. There's something, there was something and is something perhaps in our life that is really keeping us from Christ. Our self-denial is really self-deception. But of course, God is not deceived. I think we find it hard to be honest about this. That's one reason I, I, I like a guy like, there was, a, there was a, an American philosopher, somebody, some of you may have run into him, some class, some reading you did somewhere, but Mortimer Adler was his name. How would you like to be, I, would, I don't think I would like to be stuck with that name, but Mortimer Adler was a philosopher and he believed in God. In fact, he wrote, um, he wrote, uh, uh, essays and so on in favor of the existence of God. But he refused to come to Christ and he made no bones about it. He feared the cost. He understood the consequences. And he said this, he was interviewed when he was 79 years old. He said, I was on the edge of becoming a Christian several times, but I didn't do it. If one converts by a clear conscience, conscious act of will, one had better be prepared to live a truly Christian life. So you ask yourself, are you prepared to give up all your vices and the weaknesses of the flesh? He understood self-denial and he refused at that point. But the interviewer who was talking to him said this. He said, I asked him why he had never embraced the Christian faith himself. He explained that there were moral, not intellectual obstacles. The issue was Adler understood the cost of following Christ and he didn't want to do it. He wanted to hang on to the things that were precious to him. Now I'm happy to report that at the age of 81 or 83, depending on which account you read, Mortimer Adler came to Christ, became a believer, and he learned the truth of verse 24, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Once he had come to Christ, he said he wished he had done it a long time ago. You don't really lose when you come to Christ, but somehow we have that impression because the requirement is to deny self. What we fail to look at is how much we get, what we get in return. We get Christ. Well, what does it mean to deny self? I want to look at 
You know, just to give a little bit of a list this morning, it's not comprehensive. And the idol that maybe is in your life, keeping you from Christ, or maybe it's even a group of idols. We tend to be multiple, we tend to be polytheistic. We worship many gods. Well, let me list five this morning to see if this hits you anywhere. See if you, know, you thought you were saved, you thought you'd given your life to Christ, but when you really think about it, this is the thing that you worship. This is what you want more than anything else. This is what's most important in your life. Or perhaps you are here as a true believer, but you find yourself continually going back to this God that's been there in your life. May I encourage you to repent and become right with God. Issue number one that sometimes keeps people from Christ, prestige, or we might call it reputation. Reputation keeps many from Christ. Their status, their standing in the society and the world in which they live is more important to them. They'd like to sort of have the benefits of a relationship with Christ that sounds good. And when they hear a preacher or somebody else talk about what it means to, to be in a relationship with Jesus, that sounds good. But they want it only if they can, here's the key, only if they can keep it quiet. Only if they don't have to talk about it. Only if nobody else really knows outside of church. They're kind of like, you know, I, I, I call them secret agent Christians. <laughs> Only they're just secret agents. They're not really Christians. Because Jesus has a comment to make about this. He says in Matthew 10, verse 33, but whoever denies me before men, I will deny before my Father who is in heaven. What he's saying is you can't be secret and be saved at the same time. If you're not willing to name the name of Christ in front of the, whoever the group is that you run with, whoever you think is important in your life, and your salvation, very likely, that you may think you have, isn't real. So we have to ask, who are, are we holding back? You know, are we holding back because we fear how the ladies in the, you know, the bridge club or the quilting club or whatever else are going to respond? Are we holding back because we fear how the kids at school, what they're going to say if they find out that we claim to be a Christian? Are we holding back? Because we don't want guys at work or in the golf club or somewhere else to know. We're one of those. You know, we, I think we, we worry about, you know, that we're not going to, people won't think we're cool anymore, right? Listen, don't even worry about that because they don't think you're cool anyway. I mean, you know, you, you can leave that one. Believe me, they don't. but we don't want to be on the outs, right? We don't want to be the guy that's on the outside looking in. We're hung up on status. And, and, and the, then the last thing, the thing that's, you know, the thing that really gets us is that they're going to think I'm a religious fanatic. We hear how they talk about others and, and believe me, we don't want to be labeled. I, I mean, are you there? I've been there. I'm the, I, I go back there more often than I would like to admit and would like you to know. Because, because what somebody else thinks is more important to us than what God thinks, than what Christ thinks. There was a, uh, if you go to Rome, you can actually see this today at the Circus Maximus. It's been, it's been excavated and, and a, lot, a lot of the areas there, you can see the Roman Forum, you can see the, uh, well, you can see the Mamertine Prison where Paul uh, was in prison for a while. You see a lot of very interesting things in Rome. It's uh, obviously the Colosseum, w wonderful things. But in one of, the, one of the displays, you can see, and it's, it's behind bars now so that you can't touch it because there's a painting on a wall that, is, uh, that has started to fade, but you can see it without any problem. It shows, a, it shows a cross and a man hanging on the cross, only he has the head of a donkey, has the head of a donkey. And underneath... The inscription in, 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 in Latin is Alexis Menos worships his God. It shows a guy bowing down to this God. It says Alexis Menos worshiping, worships his God. It's a mockery of the Christian faith. 
Remember how the Bible talks about the preaching of the cross will be foolishness to those who perish. It's exactly what's depicted in that little cartoon figure from ancient times on the walls of Rome. But somebody was willing to go there. Somebody was willing to say, mock me all you want. I love Jesus. Beloved, if you can't do that, if we can't do that, it's a question mark whether we have true saving faith or not. I think about a guy like Noah, you know, we talked about him a few weeks ago, but God tells, comes to Noah, says, Noah, are you, are you saved? Yeah, I'm, I'm, sa- I'm saved, Lord. Do you, lo- do you love me? I love you, Lord. Are you, I'm the Lord of your life, you're my Lord. So you would do anything I asked? Absolutely. So I want you to build an ark. And you can just imagine the rest of the conversation, you know, what's an ark, what's rain, what's floating, what's, you know, t- two of every animal, are you kidding? And then for the next 120 years, what's he doing? He's out there in the yard. You can imagine the neighborhoods, you know? You can, you can imagine the CCNRs, you know, the guys that are really sticklers about that. What are, you, what are you doing here? Do you think that working on cars is bad, right? This guy's building an ark in his front yard. And, he, and he's a preacher of righteousness, the Bible tells us. So for 120 years, he suffers the mockery of the community. He must have because nobody got in the ark with him and they all had the chance. But here's the thing, beloved. It's not important who laughs first. It's important who laughs last, isn't it? That's what counts. Noah, thankfully, was willing to go through that because you and I wouldn't be here today if Noah hadn't been willing to do that. Truly saved people have traded their reputation now for the reward that's coming later. And we have to ask ourselves, where am I on that issue? Second thing that keeps people from Christ, plans, plans. Some people want Jesus, but they don't want God mucking up the plans they've got made for their life. Or, you know, more likely, they're worried about the plans God may have for them. They're they're just sure that God's going to send them to Africa, to India, to Iran, who knows where, some God-forsaken place. You know, worst case, maybe even make a pastor out of them. I mean, there's a lot of fears that go through our minds, right? And believe me, I've been at that one too. We fear the plans that God may have for us. And so we're standing back. Our plans are more important to us than Christ is. They're not really subject to his Lordship. I, I, we talked about, I'm sorry, I'm using the same illustrations a couple of weeks, but we talked about Abraham a couple of weeks ago and how God called him. And God said, I, 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 Abraham, you're going to be, I'm going to bless you and you're going to have all these blessings. You're going to be my man, but, but I have, I got to change your plans a little bit. You're living this nice upper class living here in Ur of the Chaldees. I want you to move. And Abraham says, where? And God says, I'll tell you later. I tell you, God, I hate to you know, kind of break this to you, but God likes us not to know exactly where we're going. Why? Because then we have to depend on him. We have to keep the lines of communication open. We have to have a willingness in our life that's not going to be there if we think it's all laid out for us. God doesn't always tell us exactly where he's going. He calls Peter. Peter, I, I, you know, I want you to follow me. And Peter says, great, you know. I, in fact, I, let me tell you something, Jesus. I was thinking about, I was I'm, I'm planning to expand the business next year. Going to have a lot more boats. We only use them at night. Man, during the daytime, you can use them. You can preach from them. You can do whatever you want. And what's Jesus saying? Peter, it's not your plans, buddy. It's my plans. And you're not going to be a fisherman anymore. You're going to be a fisher of men now. What do you think Peter's reaction would have been? What do you mean, a fisher of men? How do I do that? Jesus says, I'll show you later. Which he did. Are our plans keeping us? Are we scared? Let me tell you, the the greatest thing is to live the adventure that God's going to take you on. I I don't know where he's going to take you. I don't know what he's going to do with you. We've seen God already doing some amazing things with different people in our church that just 
thrill me and thrill them. It's wonderful to not know where you're going, but to know you're going with Jesus. It really is. Third thing that keeps people from Christ is pleasure. Pleasure. I can see it on your faces. You know, some of you are saying, oh, no, I knew it. I, I, I knew it. I, I knew it. If I follow Jesus, there goes all my fun. I knew it. I knew this was what was going to happen, right? We're scared to death that there goes all our pleasure. And listen, depending on what your fun is, maybe. Kind of depends on what, what it is you find pleasure in. But I'll tell you this, you don't lose your fun when you come with Christ. You may have to find a different kind. But the joy of living that God puts in you, isn't, it's not a fake joy. It's not a joy that just lasts for a little while. It's not a fun that just kind of is here and then it goes away. It stays. It's permanent. And yet we fear this. And so pleasure keeps us often from Christ. Worldly pleasures. Now, two, it comes in two flavors. Two flavors. There are sinful pleasures that keep people from Christ. They love those more than they love Christ. Yeah, they're, they're in the Bible. They're things like, you know, a lot of people find their fun in drunkenness, in carousing, in partying, you know, in licentiousness, sexual escapades of whatever kind of secret life, selfishness of whatever sort. And when it comes to Christ, they know those things are wrong, they're incompatible, but they're not hurting anybody, that's their view, and so they're not about to give this up. Usually, there's one of two things going on there. Either, either they're in self-denial about the real position that they're in, or they're thinking, you know, I'll repent later on. I'm gonna sow my wild oats now, and then I'll, I'll worry about Christ later some last minute conversion, which of course isn't promised to anyone. There are also legitimate pleasures that keep people from Christ. Legitimate pleasures. There's nothing wrong with them. They're not sinful. The only, the only issue is <clears throat> if they are on the list of priorities above Christ. You know, this is the things that we all enjoy, things like sporting events, you know, recreational activities, hobbies, clubs, social events, social media, ambition, games, entertainment, acquisitions, all the legitimate things that we do but that sometimes get put above the list of Christ. And we, and we wouldn't give them up. They're more important to us than Christ is. You know, we have to ask ourselves, when we put these things above, you know, being with God's people, above being in ministry, above serving as Jesus would ask us to serve, if the priority is I've got to, I've got to do this other thing and it comes first, then you've got to start to ask yourself, okay, is this, is this really, is this keeping me from, is this possibly keeping me from saving faith? Am I really part of the family? Or am I just kidding myself? Is this thing the God that I worship at? A truly saved life can only have one ruler and it can't be pleasures, beloved. It has to be God. T turn with me to Hebrews 11. I want to show you one guy who got this really, really right. Under, frankly, more temptation than you or I will ever face. Hebrews 11. <clears throat> Moses was a privileged man, as most of you know. And the Bible gives us some insight <clears throat> into who he was and how he thought and how he worked and how he became the man that he became here in Hebrews 11. So look with me beginning in verse 23. Hebrews 11, verse 23. By faith, Moses, when he was born was hidden for three months by his parents because, as you recall, most of you know the story, the king had issued an edict that all the children should be killed. And so Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. So in other words, 
You know, remember they put him in a little basket, remember, and put him in the river, the Nile River there in Egypt. And, and he was found by Pharaoh's daughter. Remember that? Now, you have to understand Moses' beauty, because it tells us here he was, he was a beautiful baby, was part of God's providence in his life, right? Imagine if the daughter of the Pharaoh comes out to bathe in the Nile River, and what she finds is a squally, scrawny, you know, whatever kind of baby out there, Hebrew baby. Is she going to take him home? I don't think so. But she takes one look at, you know, this beautiful baby that's laying there, this, you know, this cuddly little, cute little old roly-poly Moses. She says, man, I'm going to take this guy home. Taking him home with me, and that's exactly what she did. So God was at work in his life right from the beginning. Now notice verse 24. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, now here's an interesting word, refused. I don't, if you've got the ESV, it's the word refused. Whatever word it is in your Bible, it's the same word that's translated denied in Luke 9.23. So in Luke 9.23, it says we are to deny ourselves. Here it says that Moses denied what? He denied to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Who was he legally? He was the son of Pharaoh's daughter. So what did he do? He denied himself. Do you see? It's the same thing that's, that, that we're called on in Luke 9 to do. And the Bible uses exactly the same terminology. Moses denied himself in refusing to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing what? Verse 25, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting. Fleeting is an interesting word. Proskairos, it means face to face with time. It means time bound. He refused, he refused to enjoy the fleeting, the time bound pleasures of sin. And now here comes, here comes the real challenge, verse 26. He considered the reproach or the disgrace, or the shame, or the insults, or whatever. He considered the reproach of Christ <laughs> greater wealth. What kind of an idiot would think that being mocked and being shamed is wealth? Well, his name was Moses. He considered that being mocked for the sake of Christ was greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking for the reward. I mean, this is powerful. How did Moses refuse all that, all that glory? You know, Moses, Moses could have rationalized. He was educated. He could have done what you and I might have done in the same position and say, what, 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 you know what, I can serve God a lot better over here at court where all these evil people are and he's unsafe people. I can do a lot better there than I can out on the backside of a desert someplace with the people of God. That'd be easy to rationalize, wouldn't it? I got influence here. I think he could have rationalized this a lot of ways, but he didn't do that. How did he refuse all that glory? Well, first of all, it tells us that he saw that sin has pleasure. In other words, he didn't deny reality. <laughs> Moses knew perfectly well that sin had, it can be pleasurable. He, he had every sensual pleasure you can imagine available at the snap of his fingers. Anything that any of us, that, that, that might keep any of us from Christ, Moses had in spades, right? He had a great castle. He had rich food. He had lots of wine. He had, you know, women stashed around every corner. He had all the education you might want. He had recreation. He had TV. Well, not TV. I don't think that was invented yet. But you get the point. If it was there, he had it. It was all available. There wasn't anything that was withheld from this young man who was considered the son of Pharaoh. But Moses saw that while there was pleasure in all of this and pleasure in the sin that associated with it, he looked further. Here's, here's what Moses did. He looked further 
than now. Most, most people, most of us, don't have the capability to look further than now. Now seems hard enough in itself. Getting what we need now seems to occupy all of our time. It's all we can really look at. But Moses kept looking. He was a wise man, and he saw beyond now. And when he looked beyond now, here's what he saw. Here's what he saw. First of all, he saw that the pleasures of sin, though they are pleasurable, are fleeting. They don't last. They're only as good as until you get bored with them, or until you get too weak to do them, or too sick, or until you die. But however you look at it, they're time-bound. They don't last. You can't take them with you. And most of them don't last that long. So he saw that. Most of us can't see that. But the second thing he saw, which is, which is where most of us really can't go, Moses took the ledger sheet. And on this side, he put not just serving God, not just experiencing the joy of God, but he put up there being mocked for the sake of God. And on this side, he put all the fun and all the treasures and everything that I can have, every sensual pleasure that I can have as a son of Pharaoh in Egypt. He put those two things on ledgers side by side, and then he weighed them out, and he said, whoa, this side weighs a lot more. Man, that... You know what? You can't do that based on human experience. Human experience would tell you, oh, no, 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 no. This is more fun. This is better. This kind of life where I could have all of these things, this is the way to go. Nothing in your human experience is going to tell you that it's better to be mocked than it is to enjoy all these pleasures over here. But by the eyes of faith, by the eyes of faith, Moses looked beyond now to then. And we know that because what does it say? It tells us that he looked beyond that and he was looking to the reward. What reward? The reward that comes from knowing Christ. The reward that comes from committing to God. The reward that comes from truly saving faith. And listen, beloved, if we're going to be a truly saved individual, if we're a real believer, if we are a follower of Christ, there has to come some moment in time when we realize, you know what? It's not about now. It's about later. It's not about now. It's about then. We'll understand this full well a million years from now. It won't be any problem. We'll look back on this 60 or 70 years and say, whoa, was that insignificant? Depending on what decisions we made. But today, today, now looks so immediate, it looks so close, it looks so attractive. And Moses was able to look beyond that to now, and that's what we have to do as well. Otherwise, the pleasures of now will take us in. Moses quit being time-bound, and he became eternity-driven. You do that, and people will laugh at you. I promise they will. You'll feel isolated. You'll feel like the odd man out. Is it worth it? Well, listen, ask Moses. He paid a high price for 100 years here on earth, right? But think of him now. The pleasures of Egypt would have been long time gone. But now today, Moses has been 3,400 years and counting in the presence of God. Think he thinks he made the right decision? Are you making the right decision? When it comes to pleasures. How about the fourth thing that keeps people from God? Big one, possessions. Possessions. Treasured things. We have the rich young ruler that we all know about in Luke 18, you know, who claimed that he kept God's law from the time he was a kid. And Jesus says it's in Luke 18, 22. It says to this Young man, he says, one thing you still lack, sell all that you have and distribute to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. But when he heard these things, he became very sad for he was extremely rich. He was sad that he couldn't follow Jesus. But the reason he couldn't was because he had something over here that was more important. What was Jesus doing? Was just, Jesus just being mean, playing with him, saying, hey, 
Go sell everything you got. Testing him? Jesus' beloved was trying to do something really simple there. He was just trying to point out to him that not only was he not keeping the whole law, he wasn't even keeping the first commandment. The first commandment is what? She'll have no other gods before me. And what did this young man have before God? The God of money. Even as he walked away, he was breaking the first commandment. Broke Jesus' heart. The Bible tells us in Mark that Jesus loved him. He was apparently even more than usually attracted to this young man. But he had another God. His God was money. He was a strike three before he even got started. He was thinking of all that he was going to lose if he denied self. And Jesus was thinking of all that he was going to lose if he didn't deny self. Possessions keep us from Christ. There was an old custom in England. I don't know if they still do this, but within the last 30, 40 years they did. When somebody died, they would publish in the local paper, they would publish the results of the probate. Well, Stuart Briscoe, who's a pastor who used to live there, then moved to Milwaukee, tells about a time his father was reading the local paper one day, and he's just sitting in the kitchen reading this, and he said to his wife, well, Mrs. Jones died. His wife replied, oh, how much did she leave? And her husband quickly replied, everything. She left everything. Just like everybody does, right? (laughs) Easy question to answer. She left it all. She didn't take anything with her. It's all there. Left it all. Job said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. One of the richest men in history. Paul added, for we brought nothing into the world, we cannot take anything out of the world. 1 Timothy 6, 7, the loop closes when we die on possessions. When will we learn that? We spend our whole life gathering, and then in a moment of time, we give it all out, because that's the rules. The God of things will be gone. So we have to ask ourselves, is that where I'm worshiping this morning? Am I worshiping at the God of things? Is that more important to me than Christ? God's not against wealth. He's not against money. There are rich people in the Bible. There are poor people in the Bible. Proverbs basically says, you know, the, the, the right balance is, Lord, don't make me rich and don't make me poor because there's temptations either way. But whether God's made you rich or made you poor isn't the issue. The issue is what do you want? Listen, you can have a problem with possessions as an idol and not have anything because that's what you want. Possessions can keep us from God. What, what, would the, what would the rich young ruler say if we could, if we could talk to him today? I'll tell you what he'd say. Sell it all and take Jesus. Wouldn't he? Because that very brief time, however long he lived, is gone. You can't hang on to your things with one hand and Jesus with the other. That's what Jesus was trying to say in that passage. To deny self is to give him every idol, every possession that we treasure and say it's all over to you. If he lets you keep it, great. If he takes it away, great. Either way, you got Jesus. Don't let possessions keep you from him. That's the final thing in this passage. Well, pride, pride. This is the number one thing that keeps people from Christ. It's the refusal to believe that we need Him. It's pride. This is what happens every time someone says, no, I'm good enough. God will let me in. I don't need Jesus dying on a cross. Don't believe that stuff. I I understand He died, but it was just, you know, it was just a pathetic illustration of somebody who got him, got his, his, his mitt caught in the cookie jar because he was trying to help the poor and disadvantaged. Too bad. There's nothing substitutionary about that atonement. I don't need it. Neither does anybody else. I'm as good as the next guy. Yeah, Hitler's in hell and Stalin's in hell and, uh, you know, but I'm okay. I'm going to be good. Oh, I trust, beloved, that you're not in that group this morning. The Bible's very, very clear on this. No one's going to come to the end and be in heaven bragging that they got there 
because of their own goodness. You're not going to find anybody in heaven saying, whoa, boy, man, it's a good thing I didn't do that one more thing or I'd have been done. It ain't going to happen. Good thing I gave money to that you know, charity or I wouldn't be here. That's not going to happen. Are those things good things to do? Absolutely. Good works are wonderful after we've chosen Christ. They're useless before. Absolutely useless. Paul's idol was goodness. Look with me at Philippians 3. You find a Philippians, if, you're, if you were here long enough, long ago enough, and your Bible falls open to Ephesians, then it's just the next one over, right? Philippians chapter 3. We've looked at this before, but you remember Paul's comments here. It says in Philippians beginning in verse 3, beginning in verse 4, it says, you want to talk about good things? Let me tell you about good things. It says, I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, meaning good works. That's all it takes. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Let's line yours up against mine. Circumcised on the eighth day, this is according to the Jewish law, I'm of the people of Israel, the chosen people of God, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, I'm full blood. As to the law of Pharisee, which means everybody would have understood that means I'm doing more than the average person and more than most to try and keep the law. As to zeal, I don't just read it, I don't just give lip service to it, I do it. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. What he means is outwardly. Keeping the law outwardly can't be accused of anything. But he says in verse 7, well, whatever gain I had, whatever I was putting on the plus ledger of the side of my life, and it was a lot, I came to the point where I counted it as loss. Why? Why'd you do that, Paul? the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. He can't get over this. He goes on, he says, for his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, in him, not in me, in him. That I may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. I, I don't know how you can say it any more clear than that. My prayer is that God will remove the blindness from our eyes and help us to see, yeah, that's okay, I get it. My goodness won't get me there. It's not good enough. If Paul couldn't get there through his goodness, neither can I. Faith and works simply don't mix pre-salvation. Works cancels out faith. But the wonderful thing is what God demands in terms of righteousness, God supplies through the death of Christ. Christ. And so the moment we can come and say, okay, I, I, I give it up. I give up my sin and I accept your righteousness and really mean it is the moment we've come to saving faith. Beloved, to, to, take your, to, take, to deny self is, let me just use one final, just easy illustration. It simply means to take your hands off the wheel. It's like you're learning to fly a plane. And you go up, and by the time you're up there in the air a little bit, the instructor's gotten you off the ground. He says, here's the controls you take over. And so you do, and you start to fly. And after a while, you've made a little mistake in your course, and then you've made another mistake in your course, and pretty soon you have no clue where you're at. What's your option to get back? Keep your hands on the wheel and let him put his hands on the wheel too? No. Your only option to get back is to say to the pilot that knows where he's at, listen, here it is, it's all yours. I give it to you. Everything that I did wrong, I give to you. Everything that I did right, I give to you. 
You're going to have a change in pilots. That's what it means to deny self. Jesus says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross daily. Follow me. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this reminder of what it means to be saved. Um, Lord, I, I, I realize in your word is very clear on this. We, we will not be perfect in the way we live this out, but our heart has to be perfect toward you. Our heart has to have no intention but to live for you if we've come to saving faith. Thank you that you continually forgive our sins as we do them even after salvation. And so Lord, we don't want anyone leaving here this morning without assurance that your spirit will bring to their heart if they belong to you. But as this challenges us, I'm praying right now that any heart that has never really been given to you, thought they had, did all the things that somebody said they should do, but the truth is they've got idols tucked away. They've never made you the Lord of their life. Lord, would you please right now cause their heart to turn to you. And then as we sing this song, Lord, may it be the prayer of their life. Let them come and say, please help me. Show me how I can know more about this Christian life. Maybe a life that I thought I had and now I, I think I didn't. I want to be sure. Help us to want you more than anything to thyself. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen.